Yeah, let's go ahead and, and uh, let's have a little discussion about some of Steve's uh, information he presented. Um, this is Doug Harris, um, Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Office. I'm the Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And I just want to commend the FCC. They were the first federal agency to proactively deal with ceremonial stone landscapes in the Northeast. Um, and uh, the Narragansett tribe, along with the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina and the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, collaborated uh, with FCC and the local um, archaeological firm in doing the non invasive mapping of the ceremonial hill where the ceremonial stones were that um, were visible from the, uh, the chamber in the Valley Glow. And now, Army Corps of Engineers includes ceremonial stone landscape mapping surveys as a part of their permitting process. So thank you very much, Steve Del Sordo, for you all stepping up and uh, rocking a home run in that first opportunity. Well, thank you for the kind words. Well, you know, that's very interesting. One, uh, one federal agency comes up with a um, sort of a, a protocol of sorts or a recognition of a type of landscape, and then uh, then another federal agency steps in uh, to the same. So um, either one of you, Doug or Steve, how did, how did the Corps then, um, how, did, how did they end up uh, following in the footsteps of the FCC, do you think? Well, um, the tribes went to the Corps uh, in a um, uh, series of projects that had to do with uh, utility company right of ways. So we've got problems here. We've got a number of ceremonial stone landscapes, and we would like to articulate for you what our concerns are. So we did a presentation. We also had a film that we showed them that had been put together around the first ceremonial stone landscape, which was at Turner Falls Airport in Massachusetts, FAA. And that was a bit more of an adversarial situation. Um, but the National Register um, supported the tribe um, when the uh, SHPO was, in, uh, was not in favor of, of acknowledging these as, as tribal. But the main thing was that the tribe stepped up to the plate and we said, we would like to present to you what our concerns are. They said, please do. Um, we did, and they responded positively. They have now gone to um, three major surveys that are part of their uh, permitting process. We put together a survey team that understands the tribal concerns uh, when addressing ceremonial stones in the East. Hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, Linda, Linda McClellan has something to say on that, too. Bravo, Linda. <laughs> Doug Harris and Del, Steve Del Sordo. Um, it's great to hear of, of this project, and I was involved at uh, the Turnus Falls Airport, um, in which we, the register uh, considered the significance of these ceremonial stone landscapes uh, as part of larger cultural landscapes important to a number of uh, Northeastern tribes. Um, I guess. Um, um, I can think now of what my question was. Um, have the SHPOs of the affected states, and there's a number of states I would imagine you've been working with, and sort of Steve, you may know of some of these projects as well. Um, have they come around to recognizing the importance of these stone landscapes in these stone features? Are they listening, and have they changed their positions when these things are found in project areas? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of information on that. Um, given the large number of projects I had to pay attention to, I, would, I did this one with the tribes and, and knew from conversations with the staff that the SHPO's position was that these things were, were not Tribal stone landscapes, they were remnants of uh, farmhouses, farm fences, field clearings, and things like that, and um, didn't really explore that with them once they made it known that that's, that was going to be their position. Um, the tribes tend to be very cautious about 
who they'll talk to about these kinds of landscapes. Um, I've, I've been lucky in that they've shared some of them with me, um, but they're problematic. I mean, one of the, for the example that I, when I talked about the little slide that had the Grand Canyon, the other slide, the archaeologist for the, the cell tower company was there on that site visit when I was with the tribes and, and the, the licensee and stood, in the, stood on the top of the ridge and said there were no historic properties here. There was nothing here for the, the of interest to the tribes. And the tribal THPOs that were there said, you know, you're telling us that from the middle of a prayer circle and there's a burial behind you. Hmm. So the, the issue becomes who identifies these and what kind of knowledge do they need to have in order to do that? And is, is this a kind, the kind of information that folks want to be made public through the National Register process? Well, since 2002, the United South and Eastern Tribes has been making available resolutions uh, to the public and to federal agencies addressing this problem. And many tribes have been reticent about describing the significance of these stones. But what we're finding is that if we don't go public, then these places get inadvertently destroyed. And so um, United South and Eastern Tribes has been stepping forward publicizing these issues. And uh, um, recently, uh, in an agreement with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, I was a part of a, a team that consulted on um, the ceremonial landscapes in the Talladega National Forest in Alabama. Uh, and um, uh, Robert Thrower, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Fort Band of Creek Indians, um, organized that process um, because, um, fortunately, the state archaeologist in Alabama was supportive of these as ceremonial stone landscapes, and in many states that has not been the case. In Rhode Island, the um, currently retired state archaeologist is supportive of that process. But there's still people who are... Um, are comfortable on the fence with regard to this issue. And I think the tribes simply have to step up and step to people and say, this is what is ancient to us, and this is what, as federally recognized Indian tribes, we want you to do as federal agencies who have a trust responsibility to the federally recognized Indian tribes. Thank you, Doug and Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I must uh, leave for another meeting, but thank you very much for this presentation. Yeah, thank you, Doug. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Steve? Uh, Steve, I have another question for you. Okay. Um, it's uh, interesting, and I believe it or not, I do understand uh, why these uh, this, a lot of your projects don't come to the point of nomination that they end in a, in consensus. But even ending in, in a consensus determination. Under what uh, what guidance from the National Register are you using? Are you using um, uh, the National Register bulletins? Have you uh, developed some of your own guidance, uh, some of your own protocols, or uh, what? Tell me what kind of guides your process through some of these. Um, basically, it was sort of our own internal protocols, which I've not written down. Uh, it's just the, some operating principles that I've learned over the years. Um, a, a lot of it's informed by conversations with Valerie Hauser at Advisory Council when I worked there, which was that you know we should, as as cultural resource professionals, listen to the tribes. And if a, what, what I call a tribal recognized elder, not just a member of the tribe, but somebody with some standing within the tribe, says this is a site that's important to us, then we listen. And my agency has incorporated that in its general policies with regard to Section 106 and tribal engagement. Um, with the Upton Chamber, I would have liked to have done a little bit more work and been able to use some guidance from the National Register Program and the various bulletins, um, uh, especially the one on traditional cultural properties. But without the, the cooperation of the SHPO, it just seemed like it was going to be too awkward of a process. And so we, we did it the way 
we did, which was basically an agreement with the SHPO um, was involved um, and knew what was going on, but the work we did was directly with the tribes and our licensee. Uh huh. So it would have been nice to have better guidance. I would have felt more comfortable just because that's that's how I've grown through my career, but it just wasn't going to work in this case. Right. Well, when we start getting a little bit more specific about guidance, let's let's revisit. Sure. This. Anything else for Steve? Um, Nancy Brown here from the Advisory Council. I was just going to say that um, I'll be talking about some examples later on to where there was no formal uh, eligibility determination or nomination as a way of moving forward in a timely manner um, uh, where there was not enough information to make a formal determination. Mm. So it's happening in a lot of agencies, I think. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to Jennifer. Oh, wait. Let's ask him about historic trails. Steve, I was wondering what your experience has been with projects concerning our national historic trails, things like the Santa Fe Trail, um, the Oregon California Trails, uh, Lewis and Clark Trails. Um. My licensees have had adverse effects to, in particular, the Santa Fe Trail. Um, I'm not aware of any to the Oregon Trail. Um, we, we've we had, and it, one of the things that's a challenge for my agency is that if the trails are there, but they're not historic properties, or sink byways and heritage areas are there, but they're not, historic properties in, in their own rights, but are composed of some individual historic properties, then our nationwide program agreement with the Advisory Council and the CHIPO means that we don't have to consider those. And so I think one of the things that I'd ask the folks that manage those kinds of areas is to look at your your documentation and your legislation to, to go about, if you're interested in trying to protect those, or work with the tower companies to do it in a way that um, helps us through our regulations. So do you mean that the view shed issues are, are not con concerned for you and that you well, don't work? Say that. The view shed issues are a concern, but if, if, it's, if there's a trail nearby, somebody needs to show me how our proposed tower is an adverse effect on the store property. The same thing applies with, with, with Park Service land. I had an example which, which I've shared with with senior management at the Park Service, um, where one of a, a park was concerned about a tower proposed for several miles away from the park, and they made our licensee and their consultants go down the Delaware River in the middle of the night, for seven and a half miles, to see if they could see a lantern on the top of a crane where the tower was going to be. And that's a little excessive, but these things are being done through the Park Service's Organic Act, and we need to have further discussions about how that actually is going to work or not work. So we, we want to be responsive, but things need to be store properties in order for us to, to deal with them through the Section 106 process. I guess my question involves these national trails where you have the designation of the trail, uh, but you don't have an actual listing for all portions of the trail. Right. And a lot of those are now subject to survey and we're getting slowly getting multiple property documentation that's coming in to identify uh, intact segments. Um, it's always been my understanding that 106 does consider uh, adverse impacts that are outside, you know, within the project area um, of, of a registered property or one recognized as significant. And it's always been my feeling in dealing with cultural landscapes that those things that happen outside of the boundaries are as important uh, to consider as the things that are inside the boundaries. Uh, well, I don't disagree with that, but, but the thing that I, get, I have to get back to is that our nationwide programmatic agreement 
that governs our rules for tower siting for Section 106, we were specifically exempted from having to do additional survey work. So if when a tower is proposed and there's a scenic trail, um, scenic byway, you know, Drew 66, Oregon Trail, whatever they are, if that segment is within the area of potential effect, the APE, hasn't already been determined to be in a store property, then our licensees are not required to um, consider the effect of that proposed tower project on on that scenic byway or whatever. I thought you said that before, and I was a little bit surprised to hear that. Um, for anybody out there, is this a typical clause in uh, other programmatic agreements? No, it's not. This is Jeff. Um, you you really have a unique situation with the FCC nationwide programmatic agreement in that it gives them a lot more latitude in, in what they're able to do. But I think I think the good news is that FCC has tried to work. The, the tribal example is, is is very important to point out. Has tried to work with with people who are concerned about effects to cultural landscapes. They've tried to work with them on that outside of the 106 process. And, and we'll continue to do that. But um, you know. You need to recognize that my agency, you know, I hate to keep getting back to this, you know, we're a lawyer's agency, and every time I go to a meeting, I have my little posse of lawyers, and when I meet with our licensees, they have their even bigger posse of lawyers. The, the, the lawyers who work on telecommunications issues have their own bar association. Goodness gracious. And also, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I was just going to point out, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the lawsuit that was brought against the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation at the early part of this century, um, one of the, the litigants was the, the cell tower industry. And they were successful in um, bringing about changes that resulted in the 2004 Section 106 regulation. So they're, they're pretty influential. And um, this is Valerie. Barbara, I was going to add and ask Steve, the um, exemption from having to identify historic properties doesn't apply to properties of religious and cultural significance to tribes and Native Hawaiians, correct? That is correct. Yeah. So that's how, that's partly how landscape, well, landscapes of significance to tribes and Native Hawaiians are being identified. Oh, uh, thank you so much for that yeah, clarification. Right. Yeah, thanks, Val. Because and that and that uh, caveat in the P, in the nationwide PA is be, was because of the recognition that those kinds of places are typically not. Um, as, as Steve's been saying, typically not listed on the National Register or formally determined eligible. There just isn't enough information about those kinds of places. So you, there couldn't be a, a, a previous assumption that uh, some level of identification of those kinds of places had been previously made. Well, that's, uh, that's excellent. And uh, who, whoever uh, made sure that clause got in there, uh, Tip the hat to you. That's that, that was the United South and Eastern Tribes, the organization Doug mentioned. Okay. Well, everybody else, you know, you know take note that uh, this is why it's important for us to continue to update um, nominations and, and get landscape considerations in there for <laughs> if you're anywhere in the vicinity in the shadow of an F FCC project. Well, Steve, thank you. That was, uh, I think we all learned a lot from that, and we, we're uh, looking forward to continuing talking with you as, as we, um, you know, proceed to develop uh, guidance and, and uh, determine where there's confusion and where work is needed.